Hey everyone, my name is Perry, I'm an electrical engineer, and in this video we're going to watch Godzilla King of Monsters to see how accurate all the science and technology in this movie really are. not entirely sure what they mean by alpha frequency here because a caterpillar for example doesn't have an alpha it could be referring to alpha frequencies in your brain as what might be going on here and your brain will produce these waves when you're not focusing too hard on anything you're extremely relaxed maybe even a little bit sleepy or in a meditative state emma combined the bioacoustics of different titans to create the orca's signal a sort of baseline frequency that all the creatures respond to attracting them, repelling them, even at times calming them down. It's pretty remarkable, actually. The orca is one wild instrument for bioacoustics. This thing is incredible if this was actually real. And I believe something like this can be developed, but I don't believe it can be as portable as what they show here. Many animals will communicate using growls or grunts or body language. Some species can't even perceive sound like we can. They just feel vibrations instead. Sonar used by Navy submarines have disrupted communication between whales and dolphins and orcas. And this means that we actually do have a method of either interrupting the sound or communicating with them in one way or the other. That does not mean that we can speak whale, but that does mean that there are frequencies which other animals can pick up that we as humans can artificially create. And if you want to just do this for fun, if you have a dog, replay a video of a dog barking from TikTok or YouTube or whatever, you will see that your dog, even if it's just a recording from your phone, they will actually behave differently towards it. We don't have a recording of Mothra, Godzilla, and King Ghidorah, Rodan, right? Instead, we just have this device that can measure the alpha frequency and then spit it back out so we don't have to have previous recordings of all these animals. And there is no such uh, frequency or tone that can control anything. Like even if you played alpha wave frequencies for a human or an animal, it doesn't induce you into a relaxed state. It's not as if somebody is full of anger and rage and you take them from the middle of a UFC fight and then you just play alpha waves and all of a sudden they're like calm and sleepy and relaxed. That's not how this works at all. Hey, what's with the light show? It's an intimidation display. Consider us very intimidated. Okay. <laughs> Bioluminescence does exist in modern animals, most of which are really, really small, like jellyfish, uh, scorpions, fireflies. As animals get bigger, they usually have other methods of intimidation because really, really large animals don't have great eyesight. They actually depend on their sense of smell primarily to interact with the world around them. Godzilla, being a giant radioactive lizard, would be the first reptile I know of to display any sort of bioluminescence. I mean, th there might be some like geckos or uh, chameleons. I, I, I can't confirm that when they change their color could display it. But in general, it just animals like this don't use bioluminescence because at that size, for one, you're already pretty intimidating, but for two, most of those animals that are so large don't use their vision. That is one of my favorite scenes in this whole movie. That is such a beautiful display of Mothra. Mothra is based on silk moths from the family Saturnidae, and these are amongst the largest and most distributed moth species in the world. Most notably, there's emperor moths, royal moths, and then the giant silk moths. Another really famous Saturnidae is the emperor gum moth that you can see in the Lord of the Rings. It's the moth that Gandalf speaks to when he's on Isengard and when he's escaping. It's the same one he speaks to when he's at the Black Gate of Mordor. Oh, her and Godzilla, they like, they got a thing going on. That's kind of messed up, right? Symbiotic relationships between two different species aren't all that uncommon. He is absolutely correct. Symbiotic relationships can form between two or more unlikely species that have been observed 
all over the world in various environments. There's the clownfish and the anemones between fish and plants, and then there's Nile crocodiles and Egyptian plovers between reptiles and birds. Nile crocodiles are known for being extremely aggressive, but they are not only welcoming, but they invite these Egyptian plovers, also just called crocodile birds, and these birds will pick out the rotting or decay meat in between the crocodile's teeth. And in exchange, the crocodile gets a free dental coverage and the birds get free food. There are no immediate consequences when exposed to extremely high levels of atomic radiation. That there aren't plenty of long-term consequences, the worst of which will result in death in the next few days if you're exposed to enough of it. Even at the highest levels, your cells still have to absorb all that radiation before you can feel the residual health effects. Sarazawa is feeling the heat from that lava way more than the ambient radiation right now. All the plants and animals, except for Godzilla in the immediate blast radius, are going to die. There's, there's no avoiding that. Water, however, is surprisingly good at absorbing heat, pressure, radiation, you name it, it's the universal solvent. Our oceans are so unimaginably vast that if it was an underwater nuke that went off, which quite a few of them were actually tested around World War II, it won't have any long-term radiation effects. Oh boy, Godzilla's radiation levels are going through the roof. We got about 12 minutes before it goes thermonuclear. What do you mean? about 12 minutes it's gonna be a bad day to be a Red Sox fan that is crazy that's so cool Godzilla going thermonuclear it's, it's a really big fancy science word any big word like that whether it's a medical term or anything in science physics what have you it can be broken down very very simply thermonuclear is just what temperature it will take for the nuclear fission reaction to begin. Critical mass is the minimum amount of fissionable material necessary to sustain a nuclear reaction. Usually, this material is a really, really large element like plutonium or uranium. In this case, Godzilla is a walking nuclear reactor whose body is heating up in order to go thermonuclear. Once the high temperatures are achieved at critical mass, nuclear fission will start and the bomb goes off. On every continent, the Titans are triggering earthquakes, wildfires, tsunamis, and disasters we don't even have names for yet. Now, as before, we've been trying to lure the... A really big reason why we don't have these giant Titan monsters like Godzilla, Rodan, Mothra, King Ghidorah, and King Kong is a very, very simple reason. What is their food source? That was the reason for debunking the Loch Ness Monster. What does it eat? How does it sustain itself? How does it survive in such a small body of water not connected to the ocean? There's no way that this thing can just stay alive, let alone not get noticed by all the times that people have searched the area with all sorts of devices. 